One, two, three, four. This is my old buddy Nick Cates, a Northwest bass guitar master, bass shredder, songwriter, arranger, and all around cool dude. Nick's recorded and toured in bands like Three Inches of Blood, Kane Hodder, Curse of the North, and many others. Nick is a pretty mellow and funny dude, but he's also an intense, skilled musician, and when you get him on a stage, he transforms into an unstoppable metal monster. Nick hails from Bremerton, Washington. And that's where I initially discovered him and his band Kane Hodder. Let's set the Wayback Machine to the early 2000s. My band at the time called Pris visited Bremerton to support Kane Hodder, and I was blown away by their spastic energy, their call and response and interweaving guitar lines, and their crazy fan base. Although each member added their distinct parts with serious metal and punk rock athletic ferociousness, there also seemed to be healthy doses of levity and tongue-in-cheek melodrama. I became a fan and we crossed paths many more times through the years, including the Bamboozle in New Jersey and many other festival shows. In 2006, Nick got the call to join Western Canadian metal heroes, Three Inches of Blood. He held down the bass duties for them all the way up until their last show in 2016 at the Commodore Ballroom in Vancouver, BC. Nick toured all over the world in Three Inches of Blood, including festivals like Ozfest, Wacken, and Hard Rock Hell as well as supporting bands like Iron Maiden, Cradle of Filth, Biomechanical, and 69 Eyes. The first album that Nick recorded on with the band was Fire Up the Blades, produced by Slipknot drummer Joey Jordison. Goat Riders Horde and Night Marauders were two standout tracks of this release. When I asked Nick about his experience working with Jordison and his production style, he had this to say. I gotta say, doing pre-production with him on Fire Up the Blades was awesome. We did two weeks in a rehearsal space before recording, and it really, really helped shape and finish all the songs that ended up on Fire Up the Blades. He had lots of great ideas for tightening things up and making the songs the best they could be. I feel like once we got in the studio, he was helpful with tones and whatnot. But once we got all that rolling, we were pretty much on autopilot, laying things down before we went to mixing later down the line. Joey definitely loved to party at the time, which brought a vibe to everything involved with the process. We shared a rehearsal space with Loverboy during that time too, which is kind of a fun tidbit. Sometime around the last show of Three Inches, I joined Nick and singer-guitarist Christian Morris in a band called Curse of the North. I knew Christian from working with his previous band called Last Great Liar. Curse of the North was a three-piece heavy rock band in the vein of High on Fire, Down, Ghost, Sabbath, and Maiden. It was a co-write situation between Christian and Nick, and I was on the kit. We played around a bunch and recorded a full length called Curse of the North One at Litho Studios in Seattle. The record was produced by Christian, mixed by Kurt Ballou, and was released on the label Static Tensions. You can find the video of Sleep While You Can on YouTube. Soon after, Nick moved down to Portland and got a job working at the historic Aladdin Theater. During his time there, Nick got in a horrible accident where he fell through a roof, breaking his arm. It's been a long and winding road of recovery, but he's feeling better these days and getting back to his playing shape. I wanted to check in with him. Let's see how he's doing. Um, yeah, what a- I was doing it on a, on a Zoom phone. I'd never done it before. Mm-hmm. And I found out later, like, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? I didn't record it. You have to go to premium for it to actually capture the video. So oh, gotcha. It, so. That makes sense. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing so, okay. 
are you safe? I'm, I'm doing this. I just want to make sure everyone's safe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I was at the gas station the other day, and I, a guy, uh, he was pumping gas, and he immediately went into a bag of chips after he's done pumping gas, not wiping his hands or anything, and then he yelled across the parking lot to some person who didn't have a mask when they walked in the gas station. Get your mask on! I was like, oh, my God. Jesus Christ. It's crazy. So No wonder we're having to, so many make sure you're here. safe. Yeah. Yeah, no, we barely left the house, honestly. Like, just keeping it locked down and trying not to get fucking COVID and shit. So you can do really simplifying life. I got my chickens that are walking around. There you go. So they might visit. Uh, <laughs> I'm loving, I'm loving Madison's new channel. Oh yeah, those videos. Great. Really, she's yeah, she's she's got something there. Yeah, um, she's uh, she's really, you know, I've always told her that like. She can do all this different stuff. She just has to, she's always just have the uh, uh, electronic barrier of like learning, editing and getting the camera and stuff. And so I, I think over the years, she's kind of pushed herself into it and just did it. And now I think it's, you know, between like making movies and doing the uh, Candle the Truth and all that stuff, it's just progressed, which is great. Yeah, like doing these interviews, I never, I've caught myself iMovie and I'm you know, doing a lot of tutorials like, because once I, once I interviewed Martin Chambers and then like Chris or Kelly from Failure wasn't long after that, and I was like, oh, I'm kind of in too deep now. I gotta learn how to, I gotta learn how to edit. I gotta <laughs> learn to do this stuff. So it became this thing. Um, thanks for taking the time. I just wanted to catch up with you. Um, it's been a while, and uh, yeah, the purpose of the, the these interviews is basically, you know, I was reaching out to musical people who inspired me. Um, Cause I'm still coming back. Like I'm like, I don't know, 70, 75% of like what my, my playing. Sure. And it's mainly C6 is hands and feet. And mm. so it's always numb and tingling and like I can teach and play again, you know, and, and right when I got out of Harborview, like a week later, I was already playing and it was, I should not have done that. Like, uh, yeah. I remember you hit us up about doing a curse of the North show. Like, two weeks after you got out of the hospital and I remember, <laughs> I remember texting Christian I was like is he insane like <laughs> like does I he was. remember what he did on these songs <laughs> yeah I'm insane or on heavy drugs still yeah uh, and I know that very well from coming out of the hospital trust me <laughs> yeah I look back on some of the conversations I was having from the hospital bed that I never should have been having and I feel like really bad like for some like you know, well-known people who were, who were writing me to support me and stuff. And I was like, I was speaking drug speak. It was just embarrassing. <laughs> and I was like, I had to like go back afterwards. Like, I hope you realize that I was under, you know, this drug and this drug and I had an IV of this, please forgive me. You know? But yeah, the first show back was this band called Dr. Funk. It was down in Columbia City, but it was like, I took, I had to take a cane up to the stage and it was a two hour show Holy shit, man. Tavis LeMay, who's like drum tech to the stars or whatever, he brought his daughter and like helped set up all my stuff and did all the heavy lifting. So shout out to Tavis. But it's, and there was, they were having monitor problems in the middle of the show. Like if I just powered through, you know, doing James Brown, Tower Power, if I just powered through with no stopping, it would have been fine. But there was, they were having monitor problems. It was like an hour delay in between sets. And like five minutes into the next step, it was like, I got to stop because my head was like pulling me back backwards and I, I'd have to like I'd have to leverage my right leg to keep me upright to keep playing oh my god it was just a bad scene you know and I've been I played a lot of football and been through a lot of pain and stuff like that but the, the spine thing is like my whole my whole core is off and I, you know so I'm trying to develop new ways to get back there um but yeah I, I did want to cover your your major injury that after you moved down to Portland right um, yeah Take a little tumble through a ceiling. <laughs> uh, but let's do, um, I think I wanted to do half inside, half outside. I think I just want to keep it outside. I was, I was testing this earlier. I was super choppy, like we were in a, some kind of a space capsule, but I think we'll be okay. That looks good on my end. Cool. Um, so the first time I ran into you, what were you doing before Kane Hodder? Because we're talking early 2000s in Seattle. I was in a band briefly called The Chronicles before Kane Hodder for a few, was 
with actually Charlie from Kane Hodder was in that too. And then um, me and the Kane, some of the Kane Hodder guys were in a band before that called Sorority House a mm. long, long time ago in Kitsap. But did I, I don't know if I met you before Kane Hodder, did I? Not before. I was just, yeah. I was just curious, uh, yeah, what, what you were doing before you went up through that. Yeah, I was in a few like local bands around there that did various punk and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so you and Charlie, and, and, and then how did King Hunter come together? After that? So Sorority House broke up in like March of 2001. And then I kind of was in a couple different bands there for that year. But then Andy was like, around fall of 2001 was like, hey, we're going to start this new band and you, sh you should be in it with me. And I was living in Seattle at the time. So I moved back to Bremerton and uh, found out that they had actually started the band with a different bass player. <laughs> oh. but, then, but, then I, but then I was like, you know, thinking to myself like, that guy, he's a nice guy, but he's not the best of bass players. And I was like, they're going to call me two weeks before the first show yeah, when yeah. they realize this guy can't really play. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so I ended up then joining a couple weeks before the first show. But yeah, it's basically just all the members of Sorority House in a band that played kind of wilder music, so to speak, than yeah. just like a kind of pop punk band. Yeah. You know. First time I discovered you guys was um, I, I had this one man band uh, called. Chris and Chris, yeah. I, I never had I never had the same lineup like for any show. It's so hard to get people together, you know. And at one point, it actually got a lot of radio play. And then I would get like messages from labels, they yeah, were going to come up and see you. And I was like, oh no, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I wasn't going to tell them it wasn't a band, but uh, I really had to scrap for for friends to get together just to rehearse, you know, two nights before a show and. Then, and, I, and this one in particular was in Bremerton. Is it the Liberty? Is that the Liberty Theater? There was some big theater in Bremerton. The Roxy, maybe? Oh, Roxy, Roxy, that's right. Yeah. And this was another mixed bag of people who had like one day of rehearsal. But I, I, and I, uh, Josh Kennedy was the guy set that show. And uh, I remember all these kids walking around with like pink flyers or pink wristbands or pink gloves or something like that. It, was like, it, was, it looked like a cult. There were so many people with this pink color. Uh, they're your fans, you know, we just got thrown on the show. I was like, what is this all about? And then uh, we did our little three piece in the indie rock stuff, and then I discovered what, what the Kane Hodder thing was, um, which was awesome. And then sometime around that, that, that time, too, I was starting um, an all ages thing called the Milk Bar. You know, I was, I was a crazy person. I was like always busy, you know, just trying to figure out new musical stuff to do. So a friend of mine, and it started down at the YMCA downtown, and it was uh, six bands for oh, six dollars. Yeah. Six. I didn't have a theme song for it that KXP played. Six bands, six bucks. Starts at six o'clock. <laughs> remember that. And yeah. I asked you guys to play that, which was awesome. Uh, but I just got to know like more about what you guys are doing, and uh, I was I was totally inspired, especially that first record. You know, I blast that thing all the time. It was just it was just really unique, you know. And then. Um, uh, and then shortly after that, I started playing with Vendetta Red full time, and we did more shows together. Mm -hmm. Or did you play Bamboozle with Vendetta Red? Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> I was there too. I remember I watched you guys that day. You, uh, did, you were at the Stone Pony, I think. Yeah, I, I swear you guys played outside though at one point, didn't you? Yeah, we played. We I mean, were like across the parking lot. Uh, yeah, there was a stage there. It was that. Um, Acceptance played right before us or right after us, so a bunch of mm -hmm. bands. But I remember after we played, we went to see your show, which is like, yeah. Well, we, we were supposed to be on every day at a oh. Bamboozle and like a different place because our buddy Christian McKnight was like the booker on that and he was trying to like help us get exposure by being on Bamboozle all three days. And I was, we were all pumped, but then like the first day, I want to say got rained out or something. Yeah. And then they were like shifting bands around and because we were playing multiple times, they were like, Oh, you're no longer on a regular stage. You're the stone pony at one in the morning or something. <laughs> That's, you know, it was really like, late. It yeah. was really late. I was already, and we played with a band called Van Stone, which I'll never forget that night. Cause they had like, like uh, circular saw blade guitars. Yeah. And it was very like 
you know, <laughs> theatrical rock and roll band. They had a they had a manager who was on a like ninety cell phone who would be like, hold on, and then sing backup vocals, and then go back to his call. <laughs> oh my God, I think yeah. I probably they, they awesome. played they played right before you, right? Yeah, they, yeah. I think I so it was extra weird. Time. It was like Van Stone, and then now a wild mess of genres and jumping around and rolling on the ground. <laughs> It was fun. That, that wasn't the best period in the, in the red days for sure. Cause I, um, earlier on, before I joined Vendetta at full time, I signed my life over to this evil dude yeah. who, who invested in talent around Seattle. And there's other friends that you know of, that we both know of who's signed the same yeah. thing. Uh, and shortly before that, they put out, we did a photo shoot for Laurel Stone it was is in the middle fold of Rolling Stone. With Dave Matthews in the cover was a big thing for this uh, mobile device uh, listening, uh, whatever I uh, MP3 thing to put in the pocket. And uh, this guy called Sony's lawyer and said, "You can't use the journal's image in anything. You can't do interviews. You can't put them in the videos. You can't be in any photos." So um, I remember the the lawyer. We both know the lawyer too. He called and he said, "This was." The day of the video shoot, the song Silhouette Serenade, <clears throat> he said, you got to kick Burke out of the band. You know, he can't, he can't be in the images. And then there's back and forth and Zach's like, no, nah, he's not going anywhere. Uh, so what they did is they photoshopped me out of the Rolling Stone. It, if you watch any of the videos, all you see is my hands. Um, but that particular day, there was probably 10 interviews on the beach there by Bamboozle. And I had to, mm -hmm. I had to just like chill out do anything so it was like a that's dark so break. annoying and uh but that ties into us because um a few years after that um because we were actually very close i was like helping him recruit talent and and, and, and to talk to him you know and, and uh mm -hmm. he was a very powerful he was connected to a very powerful family but uh we i was um so angry at him and that we didn't communicate anymore we, that we that we came up with a deal. He found this new kid in um, Kentucky who was going to be like the next um, whatever white blues hero, and uh, <laughs> I said he wanted me to produce it, and I said uh, absolutely not. Um, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And he's like, well, what if you produce it and then I'll sign off on separating us from our contract? And I said absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and, I'm in. <laughs> and he's he's picturing like a normal full-length record time. He's like, oh, it's gonna take two weeks. So all the best. I'll, um, this is gonna be a big production, you know. I, and I, in my mind, I'm like, this is gonna take two hours. And yeah. uh, there is, <laughs> I think it was called Synergy. It was something connected to the Wilson sisters in Redmond the Studio. Over yeah. There. And it, um, a friend of mine, Jason Ott, was a, was an engineer over there. He also played in Chris sometimes, and he and his brother had a band called Glimpse, which also played mm -hmm. in the bar show. Anyway, I go, dude, can you show up tomorrow at the studio? I'm going to record these tracks to get out of this contract. And uh, I goes, yeah, yeah, man, and I'll throw you this amount of money, whatever. And it really didn't take that long, but I gave you a ring. Thankfully, you were available. Yeah. I was like, can you show up and just do this thing? Like, I don't even think, I didn't even send you any songs. You just showed up. I just showed up. Yeah, I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember showing up and being like, this could be a black metal record. This could be an <laughs> electronic record. I have no idea. Yeah. It's kind of my style. Like if I if I trust you, I'll just roll with it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So easy money. It didn't take long. Um, it did get me out. Uh, and we, it, the funny thing was, me and Jason, like, we knew what we were getting into. And and the dude wasn't there. He dropped this kid off and left and came back later. But we kept slipping like little secret stuff underneath the tracks, like little jokes, <laughs> like you know, curse words or sexual stuff, or just like little jokes underneath the tracks. You can't really hear it, but like little samples. You know, so that it was actually kind of a fun day. You know. That's and, funny. And meanwhile, the kid is taking it all serious. You know, he's like, "Yeah, man, I'm gonna take over the world. I love these tracks. Good bass track, good drum track." Yeah, he was. Um, I remember him feeling it <laughs> when we were when we were there. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember leaving, being like, "I guess I played okay. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't. I don't even remember what it sounds like at this point. Yeah. I only heard it when I was at the studio that day. All the one off. <laughs> you just forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, so that took care of that, and literally, like, 
I think it was only like three months after that the dude ended up killing himself. Yeah. Are you serious? Not the kid, but the oh, the guy. The, the guy. Yeah. 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 I, don't know, I yeah. guess the, the guilt kind of crept up on him or something. But weird rock stories. Yeah, that's. I mean, I feel like there's a group of people in Seattle that could get together and write a book about that guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. and like the legend of this. Like, I mean, there, maybe there needs to be like a documentary about like mm. this like subsidiary of a Seattle scene at one point in time, where this guy swoops in and has connections to all these different people that did stuff in weird ways and like the wild stories linking all of that together yeah or something and at first way back in the day like uh, before the first vendetta major record when i was kind of in vendetta and was out i was in i was out just had a baby yeah. and couldn't leave him and zach was like he introduced me to him but shortly before i signed to him he was like no 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 don't 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 no 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 and i did it anyway just because i was so poor and he's like here's a computer here's pro tools here's here's all this stuff that you want to run your own business with like, yeah you know i don't want to work amazon contracts anymore i want to write music yeah of course um when was it uh were you were you playing with three inches of blood while kane hotter was going on or did you split already i i uh i quit kane hotter to try to join three inches of blood in hindsight it probably some version of Kane Hodder could have existed with me being in Three Inches of Blood. But I just think at the time I needed a clean, like, I just want to focus on one thing and that's it. And Three Inches of Blood was so busy from like the beginning of 2006 to the, basically the time I quit the band Yeah, that it wouldn't have worked anyway. But um, yeah, I, I, I basically told everyone was like, hey, I'm leaving. And then that was it, you know, like, Went out to dinner with Andy. Yeah. Told him my, told him my piece. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And, and they then, went on and they kept rocking. And yeah, they, they were they, they still were around for a few more years. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they put out like an EP at one point. Did a couple tours. Um, so, were you from 2006 all the way up until that final show, which is where we we were united with the curse stuff. Yeah. What, what um, was there a time? Did it go consistently all the way to the end, or was there chunks that you took off from that end? As far as with Three Inches of Blood? Yeah. Yeah. You, so from, I was in Three Inches of Blood from the the very beginning of 2006 to like halfway through 2009 ish, and then a few months later, that last Kane Hodder show happened. And the way that came about was Jonah from Schoolyard Heroes was like, hey, we're doing the last Schoolyard show. It'd be awesome if Keen Hodder played this with like the classic lineup, like yeah. old times. And then I proposed that idea to everyone. And then Andy was like, well, we should just end the band there too. Mm. You know, and that's sort of how that came up. So what, you were both studio and live bass player for Keen Hodder since 2006. Yep. So what, what are the studio records you played on? Uh, the only studio record I'm on is uh, Fire Up the Blades. But um, ba basically I joined and did a bunch of the touring for the record before that, and then did Fire Up the Blades and did that whole album cycle. Um, and then was doing like writing and stuff for the record after that, uh, demos and stuff like that, but then quit before that recording started. It was like a little tour that we did um, maybe about two months before recording was supposed to happen. And then that's when I, I left. Yeah. While you were touring, because I mean, that stuff is very aggressive. You know, you're a very hard, fast player. Do you remember any stuff, any nagging stuff that you were dealing with on the road that you had to keep an eye on? Like, you know, drummers always have this, drummers always have to watch out for the carpet tunnel. And uh, sometimes they get dead foot and too much like, double single bass fast. Is there any stuff that like is nagging? Yeah, I, I've actually always had a thing with my right hand that I didn't get like professionally checked out until I was in Three Inches of Blood that uh, affected me and Kane Hodder a few times too, where like, and I didn't really understand the cause of it, but just at one point, and it could have been carpal tunnel or 
a variety of different things, but um, my hand would just freeze and I couldn't hold the pick anymore when I played. And then later I learned like a lot of it has to do with just like, I, I wasn't like warming up properly. And like, you know, you like, you're really cold outside and you go into this hot show and your muscles tense up or vice versa, or it's, you know, it's really cold outside and you play the show and it's, you know, steaming hot and, or, you know, cold in the venue or, and, you know, it wouldn't happen all the time, but it, when it happened, it was really bad. Like I, I could barely play with my, like I would have to stop playing with a pick and I could barely play with my fingers. And then I would just sort of have to like yank my thumb back to try to like stretch it in between yeah. songs. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad. And I got a couple like cortisone shots over the years for stuff like that. Uh, which helped for a while, but then... Um, Where did you get the shots? Just, like, right... Right in it. Right in yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but uh, later, I went to, like, a physical therapist and basically had, like, kind of broke down what was going on with my hand. And they were like, yeah, man, you just need to, like, do these hand exercises. And then when before you play, every single time, just warm up for, like, 45 minutes. You know, as, as long as you can get away with, essentially, and then take a break and then play the show. Uh, and so basically every show in Three Inches of Blood, almost every show in Three Inches of Blood I ever played, because it never happened. Once I once I did that, it never happened again. Um, oh. It's because you never so, did anything about it before. Yeah. I just never, you know, you're a kid, you know, yeah. you're just like, and punk bands, like, oh, yeah, I just want to play the show. Like, physical needs of my body are such yeah. a, in the, you know, like not even on the top of my mind. And once I sort of like started stretching and taking care of my hands, uh, not only did I, that never happened again, I started playing better and like being looser and like yeah. more like ready, especially for like a fast sort of technical thing like that. You know, when your right hand has to play, you know, gallops and stuff for extended periods of time, it's, if you're not yes. ready for that, <laughs> it, it, it could definitely catch up with you. It's usually neglect, you know. It's like there was yeah. probably a period in each band I was in that, that did any kind of touring where I came to a point where they were spasming and I couldn't hold the sticks anymore. And it's usually just telling me I'm neglecting constant um, maintenance. You know, yep. It could start, even if it's your hands, it could start when you're at the shoulder movement and seeing a massage therapist. I remember dip, dipping my hands in hot wax on some tours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, going straight from burning scalding water into ice and back and forth and all this kind of stuff, all, all the stretching, you know. But yeah, growing up and you're doing all this, you don't think that it's ever going to happen, so you're just playing punk music and just hard as you can, yep. fast as you can, and then all of a sudden, well, what's going on? I'm in hell. So, a very, yeah, a very, it's, it's at the top for me, like, constantly obsessing about staying under, and I mean, I'm not even, post-accident, of course, you know, but even pre-accident, I was really in tune with, like, <clears throat> making sure I was completely warmed up properly. Yeah. No matter if it's heavy stuff or light stuff. It it's all effective, for sure. What was, uh, so what What am I missing with, with this, the bands that you've mentioned already? I mean, you're such a prolific, you know, shredder, and I'm sure there's stuff you played in the and you even knew about. Do you remember I played two shows with Vendetta Red? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, even even though just two two little shows, there is some stories I'm not gonna. There's stuff. There's fun things that happened. <laughs> Those two shows. But I really appreciate you. No, no, I, I, I had a great time playing, and uh, that's the only time I've gotten to play the Doug Fur in Portland. Uh, which oh yeah. I really enjoyed that show. It sounded, I remember it sounded really good on stage. I could hear everything like crystal clear. And I was like, wow, this is so rare that you walk on stage as an opening band for anyone yeah. and can like genuinely hear everything, not using inners or something like that, you know? That was a pass. Yeah. And I like Ash a lot too, which yeah. was another bonus for me on that. They are still, I was just talking with Don from Super Drag the other day, and that's where we met and we were playing with Ash way back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. and, they're still doing it. They're still releasing records. They're still plugging away. They still That's awesome. Yeah. It's Is very... Super Drake still around? No, he, he's in a... I'm not sure what the other guys are doing, but he's in a, a Knoxville band called 
Mick Harrison in the high score. It's a little gotcha. more Amer Americana. Cool. They reunited in 08 or 09. I might put out a record. Still kind of gathering information about that. They're, they're fine. They're, they're all cordial. They're cool. I love Super Drag. Yeah. John the super cool guy. Um, but beyond uh, Vendetta Red, did you do any other sessions? or? Um, uh, I mean, Chris of the North with you, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, trying to think. Oh, I was in a band in Portland for a little bit called Moondrake. Um, and it was like a 70s rock kind of thing. And we did some like demos that we sold at shows, but it was never like, it was never really a record. Those guys, I love those guys as people, but they weren't the most organized crew that I'd ever been around. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't really see a record ever forming from that. And then I, when I was in that band, I was basically like, oh, I got this new job, guys. Like, I'm probably gonna have to like slow down a little bit, yeah. like playing all the time. And it was like two months later, I broke my arm and then Ooh. didn't play again for a long time. Yeah. Uh, Chris and North, that was, that was a fun project. We did, we did some interesting shows. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Christian's such a, um, Christian Morris, he's such a consistent songwriter. You know, and uh, yep. there was there was a lot of freedom in that band you know, um, within the framework of a pop song, even though it was you know, the down tempo heavy rock. Mm -hmm. call it. And, yeah, he gave us a lot of freedom uh, just to kind of do what we wanted, and, and I think live, um, just because of that freedom, I think there was a lot of energy coming off the stage. It's yeah, absolutely. Cool. I mean, it's. Yeah. When you got three people that can play that are you know in those like grooves together and you know you're kind of like freewheeling and letting it ride that's that can be really fun for sure i'm using one of those tunes for the audio version of this um, intro oh. and outro oh awesome electric wall oh yeah yeah <laughs> the drum intro yeah 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 and when i hear it now like it's been so long i hear it, I was like, oh that was stupid why did i do it <laughs> and people won't hear that um, and then, so after that, you moved to Portland shortly after we stopped doing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, like, I mean, I got a job opportunity down in Portland, you know, and when you work in the music business, you sort of have to roll with it, you know, like, not many people can actually, like, make a real living working in any form of the music business, yeah. so I uh, got an opportunity to, to kind of progress down in Portland, and I was kind of sick of Seattle as well. You know, I've been here for a really long time and looking for a bit of a change and Madison was into it too. So we, we just pulled the trigger and did it. And then I told Christian too, I was like, I'm still down to play, but then it just never really happened after I moved. Yeah. You know. We're always poking around. Right now we're looking at like central Nevada. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're always kind of, yeah, we're kind of over Seattle. I mean, the place we're in now. Uh, I mean, it's like you got a sweet setup out there. Yeah. yeah. We're like 50 yards from a lake, you know, and uh, get chickens. And totally. I've always seen Leanne post videos about like walking around with the dogs and stuff. Yeah. It's it's paradise out here. It's outside the city and stuff. So we probably belong to this property in the Airbnb or something. But we're all, we're all on, like, just land. Like, oh, we could put a camper there. Yeah. And there's a stream. We're good. You know, we, don't yeah. need, we don't need anything. That's it, technically. Uh, <laughs> and then but then your accident, you know, I heard about your accident and uh, I was freaked out by it. Do, do, is it too hard to talk about? I mean, basically, um, I was working as a production manager at the Aladdin Theater in Portland. And uh, the guy who was the production manager before me was it was like his last day and he was like oh hey nick before i leave i should show you a few things that you should know so when i'm gone you can figure it out if you need to and one of the things was he's like oh this is how our lighting runs go to our like like over the it's it'd be like the forest downstage truss that's in the ceiling that's like permanently hung there um i'll just show you how those go to the to the truss and i'm like uh, okay and then like this theater was built in like the 20s you know what i mean and has been like messed with a bunch of times since then so it's old and 
junky and obviously hasn't been updated in many, many, many years. And it's it's got a charm to it that's awesome. I mean, you see shows there at Rules, but, you know, the facilities themselves definitely are older. So up in the ceiling, you have to wear, like, asbestos masks and all this shit, and it's sketchy. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a large guy, and I probably shouldn't have been where I was. Um, luckily for me, uh, where I fell through the ceiling wasn't, like, over the audience portion, because that would have been like a 40 foot drop and I probably would have died. Now I didn't fall all the way through and that's why I broke my arm is because it, unless I like put myself vertically and went through the area I was at, I wouldn't have fit through and I was like, you know, crawling. So it, it you know, basically what happened is I put my leg into a section of the kind of the, the walkway where you're kind of crawling up there and I went to push off and it, my foot slipped and that kind of section broke and my my leg went entirely through the like popcorn ceiling. And then my whole body weight came down and crashed on my arm right here on a big wooden beam. You know, it happens, you know, happens in a split second. And then I'm like dangling in the ceiling and I have to like pull my arm, which, which is jello at this point, like up like this and like lay on my back. But it was so hard to get where I was at to begin with up there that they had to, <laughs> they actually had to call the fire department and I'm like laying up there with this like you know the, the bone isn't sticking out but it's like you can see where the bones are I mean it's my arm is all so messed your, up. So your legs were dangling and you had to pull your arm One of my legs was dangling but I managed to sort of like through the pain and like adrenaline pull myself back up into one of the like walkway beams and lay on my back in the ceiling and then I was like trying to move, but it was like, there's so much shit up there. You know, I can't even imagine what sort of like safety regulations are not being followed by having that the way it is. Um, but I couldn't quite like by myself, like get out of there, you know, cause I was probably like 20 feet from the, the ladder to kind of go back down to the lighting booth. And so they, they ended up having called a fire department and they, couple guys crawled up there and put my arm in an air cast and then sort of like helped me shove myself back down this walkway so I could get to the ladder then climb down the ladder with one arm and you know then go into an ambulance but they couldn't give me any meds until I got to the ambulance you know and so the whole time I'm shaking myself and like squirming along in the ceiling my bones are just like, you know, my jello arm is just like breaking, like the, the broken bones are just like touching each other and all those nerves are just firing. And it was very, very, very painful <laughs> to say the very least. Um, but once I made it into the, to the ambulance and I was like, give me the good stuff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was, it was better ish, you know, after yes. that, but you know, like when I hit my, it was obvious that when I broke my arm and I've broken bones before this, but um, that my like hand wasn't doing anything, you know, like the second that happened. How long was the rehab after that? You still rehab? Uh, I mean, still kind of, I mean, it's never going to be the same. Like I still have like the whole, like from here all the way down my arm and into my thumb and my first two fingers, like this still feels numb at times. And then this part, they're still not really feeling it on the top of my thumb. It's just tingly. And then these kind of come and go, you know. Um, but I was in physical therapy for probably a year and a half. How's your grip? You know, just, it, it's good. It's, you know, the grip is, is good. Once, basically, I crushed my, was it, radial nerve that's up near my, you know, it runs all the way down your arm, the back of your arm. And the whole reason I ended up having surgery is because uh, uh, the doctor told me that they didn't know if I just like, you know, bruised or crushed the nerve or actually severed the, like one of the pieces of the bone possibly could have severed the nerve. And so in order to not like, because they thought they might be able to just kind of piece my arm back together sort of and just put it in a cast or something or put it in a sling and just let it heal, not having surgery. But then I was like, well, if I get three months down the road and my hand is still not working 
And then they're like, well, maybe we should go check that out and then have surgery and then do that full recovery. I mean, that's gonna be another, that's just like three months wasted essentially to me. So I was just like, just do the surgery. And it turns out it was just crushed, but it was crushed all the way up here. And I guess it grows back, they say like a millimeter a day. Um, so it took a long, long time for it to get down to like here to where I could actually move my wrist again. Cause for like, cause I broke it. Um, it was like June 13th, 2007. And it wasn't until like, uh, and I got married in November of that year. And uh, it was like a week or two before I got married was the first time I could go like this with my wrist. It was like, I couldn't put it all the way up, but it, but I could, I could kind of get it straight, you know, but before that it would just, it was just a limp wrist. And all I could do was kind of go like this with my fingers, you know, and luckily for me, like I can, when I play bass, I sort of cock my wrist anyway. Yeah. So I could sort of dangle my arm and I had enough grip with my two fingers, my thumb and my first finger to sort of play, obviously not well by any stretch of the imagination. But right when I could kind of do that, I started trying to play as much as I could just to get any sort of muscle back. Cause you know, obviously when you atrophy from just it sitting in a sling for months on end yeah. while that heals, you know, it took a toll on the muscles. I back in yeah. as soon as you feel like it. Just, like, uh, I reached out to a couple pro dudes, drummer dudes when I was in the hospital who had neck things, nothing like what I had. But I was like, well, how did you start? And they're like, drum, get on the kit. You know, it's using all your body parts just as soon as you can. Yep. So I plugged away. So I had a kit delivered to eat, uh, to, um, way too early. The doctors were pissed, right? I kid delivered to the hospital and he said, you gotta, you gotta put this down on the fourth floor in the physical therapy and you're weeks away from that. So, um, but I just stared at it in the hospital bed. <laughs> and then uh, one of my friends looks at, you know, moved it for me once I finally got down to therapy. But that was joyous. Yeah, for, actually, there's a video of me playing like on a trash can with a catheter in. I remember that, yeah. Down. Uh, that was the first step. And an electric kit and stuff like that. And the funny thing about that was early on, even before I had this, so, so I was in there and then we were deciding to have the surgery or not have the surgery. Does the percentage say this, that you'll get this much improvement or you can wait to heal naturally maybe? Or, and, uh, and I got this, Andrew poked his head in, <laughs> but I had a brace on and stuff. I was like, what the hell are you doing here? I never even knew, never even knew he was there. He was working there. Yeah. He was like, He's like, a respiratory therapist. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing the, the, the blowing uh, the blowing drills that you have to do. Um, they test you, you know, a couple times a day, go into the tube and stuff. And, um, I don't even think he was assigned to me. He would just poke his head in like twice a week just to check on me and the house. Um, so, so uh, nerve-wise, what are you feeling these days? You still had to get, I mean, you talked about the numbness, but is, is there yeah. any like, sharp pains or anything like that? Or are you just doing, um, I'll get spasms yeah. occasionally. And then like, yeah, I definitely got num numbness and tingling at time. It's not all the time, yeah. you know, but it's, you can feel it. And it, it, it's weird because like, uh, you know, and I, who knows why, but uh, my wrist will still feel like kind of asleep in some ways at times. Because um, one, one of the hardest things for me and, and one of the things in physical therapy that took the longest was basically my physical therapist would put his hand on top of my wrist and just say, push as hard as you can. And we would do this constant, like, like working out my wrist and my hand, just getting that because just lifting it for the longest time was really hard but then getting any sort of strength in that took forever. And still at times, like even when I push it right now, you could feel that it's like got a little bit of that asleep feeling in my wrist, you know? Yeah. I, yeah those are my ankles these days. The guy, I, I see a chiropractor, a guy called muscle activation technique, and another guy who's a pain specialist. And they're all trying to get me to do the, um, the dorsiflexions that I don't have really very much anymore, and that's going this way with the foot. 
Yeah. I can do that. Uh, but playing drums, it's like I need to use my whole leg now. I'm trying to get this back, which is like a real quick trigger stuff for me. Yeah. I mean, it's really weird. I mean, you can tie a band around your foot up to something and, and do this, but it's a really awkward way to try to exercise your foot. It's not like you're leaning off a stair and stretching the calf. Mm -hmm. So it's real weird. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. I'm always trying to outsmart this thing. <laughs> and it's taking a long time. Yeah, sometimes it just won't let you. It's your body's like, it is what it is, you know? It's just got to power, power on it as long as you can. I'll play it, you know, I'll teach and play and teach and play and I'll just be the same, not improving, not improving. And then one day I'll be able to do like, something new that I used to be able to do and that'll like give me a spark you know and I thought I was totally fucked and, and oh I was able to I wasn't able to do that last month. So but I'm very impatient. <laughs> um, because the surgeon originally he said uh two years you're kind of probably gonna be what you are. So I'm at about a year and a half now. And uh, I don't wanna be this <laughs> so Yeah I mean they said the same thing to me like yeah. My my surgeon, who was a great dude, and I ended up becoming like good friends with um, after the surgery and stuff, because he loved music and going to shows, and I would get him into shows in Portland and stuff. Um, he told me it would be like two to four years before your your arm felt the best it's gonna feel, you know. And I'm three years in and change right now, so you know maybe it'll end up feeling a little bit better, but. I mean, as it stands, it's, you know, maybe like 85 to 90% of what it was before, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. You know, it took a long time, you know, and playing like, playing bass is one thing, because bass is it's kind of like a, especially like the way I kind of play is kind of caveman. You can just pound the crap out of it and it's all good. What actually really got the, sort of the fine motions back was playing guitar, yeah, yeah. Um, six string guitar. And... Like I couldn't palm mute for the longest time. Like that was out of the question, you know, but like picking and like kind of those finer motions, just doing that over and over and over again at home, just sitting on the couch really helped. You're a super good guitar player too. You write, you write your own songs as well, don't you? Hmm? Yeah. yeah. And I, so I co wrote a bunch of those songs with Christian too. Yeah, yeah. It's just really, fun, you know, the guitar part for me is super frustrating. If all your fingertips are numb, you try yeah. to do bar chords. So, you know, it, you know, cheating myself away around it. Right now. I mean, forget about recording any kind of guitar right now. You know, I can teach and stuff. But I'm bartering with the higher power. Like, if you <laughs> let me jog again, because I used to jog all the time. And yep. You could let me play instruments. Like I used to, then I promise to be a totally rad person. <laughs> or I promise not to do this other bad habit. So, like, that's another reason why I started this channel. I was like, I can go into total self pity, or I can put some positive stuff out there, talk to some rock heroes, and tell their story. And, or, or not. Like, I've come across some guys who are like, I've never been injured. I got nothing to say. And I was like, that's cool. Well, let's just keep talking. <laughs> talk, talk about music then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I got a couple. There's been a, a couple that are like, wow, this, I can't believe this happened. And then like five minutes before the interview, they pull out. Or um, our publicist will get right back to you and we'll, we'll make it for Tuesday. And then the publicist never writes back. Stuff that are like gigantic, you know. Like yeah. I can't but I think I'm doing okay. I think I'm batting like, I think I'm batting around 800. That's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure the more the channel progresses and the more views and stuff you get, it'll be easier to rope in the, those bigger fish too. Yeah. Um, and it's it's starting to get like it has like a little bit of a rhythm now. The way I edit it and, and stuff like that. It's still coming from me. Like, I hate talking. I'm not social. <laughs> I hate my voice. I hate conversing. I hate being around people. And it's like for, it's like going to the gym, you know. It's forcing me to yeah. you know, the vulnerability thing. Can't hide anymore, kind of. That's good though. I mean, it's you know you talk about putting positive things out, but this could be another aspect of that. Like, just 
you know, a situation creates, you know, a physical situation for you. And you're like, well, in order to keep positive, now I'm having these talks with other people that have experienced these things like I have, Yeah. you know, and, you know, puts you in a better mental state too. I mean, I know it, talking to people about like being able to play again after my injury helped me a lot, you know, just with friends and stuff that have had arm and hand injuries and stuff. And, you know, keeping that hope that I'd still be able to play at some point, you know. This is Goldie. Oh, Goldie. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> she's, she's the leader. <laughs> we got Rizzo and we got Penny. She's bronze and black. And we got Arlene Featherfoot. She's a drama. <laughs> Brahma's going to grow to be like six feet, but she's. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, like even that, like I mentioned to Martin, the, the pretenders drummer. I was like, just the thought that we were confirmed to talk today, you know, last week, I, I, I already started playing drums better. Yeah. Like just that energy of like, I don't know. It's, I mean, it definitely helps like staying on that positive track. And then Kelly from Failure, mm -hmm. he had like some really cool suggestions, you know. Because the biggest thing for me is I talk myself out of stuff when I'm playing. Like when I'm trying to develop certain foot movements on um, quick stuff, da -da 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 -da, different patterns and stuff like that that aren't quite there yet. And I'm playing along to a track. It's like, okay, here comes that tricky part. And then I fuck it up because I'm thinking about it so much. Sure. Yeah, it's easy to do. And but just, just try it. And he was, he's, he was really trying to push me, like, don't think about it. Just flow with it. That's going to stop you every time. You know, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And it's really weird. Like, if I just jump in and I start jamming on some complicated stuff that I've wanted to be doing for a while, without thinking about it, it's totally different. The, the connection between, you know, the brain and, and, the, and the body mm -hmm. is really weird. And, yeah, you know, I mean... No more better way to discover that than, you know, if you lose everything that you've taken for granted before. <laughs> oh, I know. Trust me. I mean, I, I've sort of prided myself on being a guy that can, like, you know, improv, like, bass licks on the fly all over the fretboard in any situation that I've played in. And when I first started playing bass again, I would basically, I turned into, like, the ACDC bass player for the first six months I was back, you know, because I literally couldn't make my hand jump to the other strings quickly, you know? So th in a similar fashion, it was just like, I really want to do this. And I, in my, my left hand's ready to go, but my right hand won't produce it, you know, <laughs> it'll just, and so I remember the first couple jams I tried to have maybe like a little, a little under a year after my accident, it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, and I was like embarrassed, like, and I, and I, you know, I was, it just showed me that I still had a long way to go to be able to do any of that again. Yeah. You know, and I really still haven't played much publicly. I was, obviously no one's playing publicly right now, but <laughs> uh, since getting, then, you know. Just getting together with people. And... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so we just keep witch-shedding, keep trying to get better. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the shows, once I was ready to play more after that, those initial post-hospital shows, they were perfect. Like, one was that Tower Power cover band, and I don't have to slam mm -hmm. or anything. It just makes me concentrate on listening to the other band members, because they're all shredding. They're all like yeah. A-list horn players. And uh, they're two-hour shows. And, and the other one was playing for this guy, subbing for Ben Smith, for this guy, Leroy Bell. He was, on, um, he was an X Factor contestant. He's written songs for Elton John. Um, it was just a little quiet three piece, this R&B stuff. And it was perfect. You know, we did yeah. this summer festival stuff last year. Didn't have to show off too much, just keep the pocket. You know? If I had to jump in, and I did try a couple of them at Red Shows, which I never should have done. But yeah, jumping right into the more aggressive stuff you know, was a long move. But the other shows were great just to, just to try to feel comfortable on the, on the kit and, uh, you know, just prove, like, hey, you know, I'm not dead. And, uh, I can make sound. Yeah. And other people have confidence in me still. So. Well, 
I've, I've known you for quite a while, and I have no doubt that you're going to get every ounce of what you can get out of that body <laughs> before too long. You know. Yeah. I live on the lake, so we are doing more of that. Getting, getting all the limbs involved. Um, yep. what's, what's, uh, so what's on the table right now? You're not the Aladdin anymore. No, I, I work for the Seattle Symphony technically right now. Okay. Uh, and I'm the I'm a I basically am a production manager there, and I do all the shows that the symphony isn't playing on that the symphony puts on. So when like the Seattle Symphony presents, you know, like Burt Bacharach playing solo, I run those shows, like stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. But we're all furloughed right now, so it's yeah. like <laughs> we'll see if that ever happens again. Um, I really appreciate the time, dude. It was good to catch up. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to chat. When you asked me to do this, I was like, of course. Yeah. You know, you know, if you want to talk, <laughs> there's not many people I know directly that have had like serious injuries that are musicians. Yeah. And so it's always always nice to talk to people that have gone through similar things like that. I actually we had a barbecue a couple of weeks ago, and it took me forever. I was able to track down the first person who found me in the road. And she happened to get two in the morning and crashed. It was a retired, or not, no, she's still working. She's a nurse at Valley Medical yeah. Center. So I invited her over to uh, the barbecue. And, uh, it's a total sweetheart. She was like, she's like an angel, you know. And her, her um, husband is a retired nurse also. So they were both describing to me what they witnessed approaching the wreck scene. And uh, uh, it was really interesting, all the details that I didn't know about. I thought, crazy. It, I thought it happened on a totally different part of the road and they told me where actually where it happened and they described everything and they thought my legs were crushed and I was, where I was positioned and, and you know, the car was demolished and stuff. But they were looking for me the whole time. They didn't know where I disappeared to either. So it was, it was really cool to reunite and uh, be able to thank her like that. That's really cool, man. That's super cool. Um, cool. Anything uh, you need from me, never hesitate. Of course. Reach out and... Uh, as soon as this is all edited up, I'll send you a link to it. Cool. Awesome. Hey, um, I'm going to stop recording that. I'm going to ask you something right after this. Cool. Uh, thanks, Nick.